We were given a unique opportunity. MIT is collaborating in building a new university in Singapore, Fourth National University, Singapore University of Technology and Design. The Singaporeans came to MIT and they said, we essentially want to replicate what, what is called at MIT the General Institute requirements to physics, to math, chemistry, biology. And we said, and they created, the MIT faculty gave them the material, created the material for them. We said, we think we can do something else. We took each of those courses. We asked the faculty to create what we call intended learning outcomes, which for most faculty tends to be the topics in the course. That's not quite what we were talking about, but OK, that's where we could start. Intended learning outcomes, there were hundreds of them. We literally cut them up into single strips of paper. I wish I had one of those smart tables. I just learned about smart tables last night. Because we cut them, we put each of those single pieces of paper on a huge table, and we began to move them around to see where the intersections of biology, chemistry, math, and physics are. It turns out that when you do that, and the engineering faculty in the room, if there are any, are not going to be happy with me as I say this, but when you do that, there are about five major ideas that you want students to get by the time they finish an, inter an engineering curriculum. Maybe five but certainly in that neighborhood. This is an early prototype of what we call the curriculum map for the SUTD curriculum. Now, think about connecting that idea that there are only a certain number of major underlying ideas in a curriculum with the ability, and I hate the word, but I'm going to use it to kind of crowdsource. So that as we have students moving through what have been conventional courses since about 1600, we begin to see where they're going in terms of the connections of ideas, most importantly for science and engineering, what the misconceptions are, and we begin to develop these curricular maps in a way that really facilitate learning. My colleagues at Carnegie Mellon have done this with a statistics course. They have found by doing blended learning, using online and face-to-face, -face, that they can teach the students in an introductory statistics course in half the time and get more learning results. One of the things we found was that for an online course, many students prefer to blast through the material that was at 1.5x playback speed, since it allows students to make much more efficient use of their time. In a normal Stanford class, you know, professors like me tend to just blab and slow things down and make space to make sure that everyone is following with us because different students need different amounts of time to follow along. For an online class, blast through the material, and if you miss something, you just do an instant replay. Um, by having, we also, uh, what us instructors, as Laurie was saying, to take our long lectures and break them down into, say, 10 minute video chunks. And by posting short to video chunks online, this allows the instructor to post optional prerequisite, optional advanced material. It also allows the student to navigate through the content in their own ordering and at their own pace, moving us away from the one size fits all model of education. A course, of course, is much more than video, and a uh, course also has homeworks and assessments. When we talk about assessments, we often think about the purpose of evaluating or assessing student performance. But I think the far more important purpose of homeworks is not to evaluate student learning. Instead, it is often the homeworks that's, that is what actually causes long lear learning to take place. Um, we know the students learn best not by passively listening, but by having opportunities to practice with the material. Many pedagogical studies have shown that, in this example, is retrieval practice or being tested on the material that causes the neural pathways to be formed that correspond to long-term long retention. Because of that, we built in many opportunities for students to practice with the material. Let me just show you one example of what we call an in-video quiz in which you see the instructor give a lecture, and then right there in the middle of the lecture, the video pauses and the instructor asks the student a question.
Here's the video. These four things, prospect theory, hyperbolic discounting, status quo bias, base rate bias, they're all well-documented. So they're all well-documented deviations from rational behavior. So here, the instructor wants to ask a question, video pauses, the student answers the question, didn't quite get it right, and so they get to try again. And they get it right. You can see an optional explanation, and then the class moves on. And I want to contrast this with my experience teaching a Stanford class, perhaps your experience when you were teaching when, when you were taking classes. When I teach my Stanford class and I ask a question, um, usually about half of the class is still madly scribbling away, you know, trying to write down the last thing I said. In my class, usually about 10% is 10% um, of my class is zoned out on Facebook. And invariably, there's always that one smarty pants sitting in the first row that blurts out the answer then I feel really good that someone answered my question and the class moves on. And so, in contrast, on the website, the video pauses and every student gets to attempt an answer. Every student gets instant feedback on whether they're getting the material or not. Um, and ironically, this can be more interactive than a large lecture classroom where you know, only one student or a small handful of students got to engage with the question.